from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is Ag Day. A new effort to fight hunger across the country. There's real opportunity here for the farmer to play a role. How a new White House plan could benefit livestock producers. Gas prices are lower, but so is ethanol production. I'm Michelle Rock. We'll look at some of the reasons why U.S. ethanol production is seeing a slowdown. As Hurricane Ian closes in on the Florida coast. In some areas, there will be catastrophic flooding and life-threatening storm surge. What days of rain and wind could do to Georgia's cotton crop that's ready to harvest right now on Ag Day. Good morning, I'm Quentin Griffiths. We have lots to get to this morning, including a new White House effort to end hunger and also increase fertilizer production here at home. But first, the latest on Hurricane Ian, the storm continuing to inch closer to Florida, where it's expected to make landfall late tonight or early tomorrow morning. Now, the storm lashing western Cuba is a major hurricane. The island seeing significant wind and storm surge where Top winds of 125 miles per hour were reported. As much as 14 feet of storm surge was predicted. Now officials evacuating 50,000 people took steps to try and protect the tobacco crop in the country's main growing region. The Robina tobacco farm is the most famous farm in Cuba. It took a direct hit from the hurricane. It's where Fidel Castro used to get all of his cigars from. The owner saying he lost many structures and the tobacco he was growing. In some areas, there will be catastrophic flooding and life-threatening storm surge. And so if you're on Florida's Gulf Coast, uh, from Naples all the way through the Tampa Bay area and some of the counties north of that, uh, that could be something uh, that happens. And, and it will certainly happen uh, in some parts of Florida's Gulf Coast. Now, Georgia cotton farmers are closely watching what Hurricane Ian will do. USDA says in the latest crop progress report, 74% of cotton bowls have opened in the state and only 3% of the crop has been harvested. The concern carrying over into markets right now. Ag Day's Michelle Rook will take a closer look at that coming up in analysis. Forecasters still continuing to update the trek of Hurricane Ian. Meteorologist Matt Yurisavik joins us with an update. Matt. Yeah, Clinton, that's right. We are tracking Hurricane Ian as it moves closer to the Florida Gulf Coast. So we want to get the latest on this storm system, where it's going to be centered as we head towards the afternoon and evening on Wednesday. And really the track depends on if it makes landfall later in the evening today or in the overnight hours. That's something we really need to keep an eye on. But showers and storms wrapping into this thing. Winds really starting to go up everywhere from Key West all the way up to Tampa as we head through the day on Wednesday and you can see that storm system making landfall and future track has it later on this afternoon and evening heavy rain farther to the north and over the Tampa area but it looks like uh, the worst of the storm surge and the extremely strong winds could be just to the south near Cape Coral Fort Myers maybe even Naples getting in on some of that as well still producing heavy rain and gusty winds as the storm system starts to move across the peninsula of Florida with some showers making their way up along parts of the southeast coast and then from there depends on how it interacts with that cold front but it does look like extremely heavy rain and in some cases we could be talking about in this area north of that center of the uh, storm system there wherever it comes along the land we could be looking at 12 to 18 plus inches of rainfall and again extremely high chances for flooding rains as well as storm surge with this system and we'll have more coming up in just a little bit. All right, thanks, Matt. Continuing our look at the latest crop progress report, USDA says 12% of the corn crop has now been harvested. That's 2% behind the five year average. Soybean harvest also starting to pick up with 8% now cut. That's 5% behind average. And 31% of the winter wheat crop is now on the ground, 1% ahead of average. Hurricane Ian is not expected to impact U.S. fuel prices. Right now, the national average sits at $3.74 a gallon for regular gas. That's according to AAA. Now, that's up $0.07 cents from last week. For diesel, it stands at $4.89, down a few cents from a week ago. And while gas prices have been trending downward, so has ethanol production. Ag Day's Michelle Rook looks into the reasons why. 
United States ethanol production has dropped to levels not seen since the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. Production has been running well below a million barrels per day for several weeks and usually slows in the fall for plant maintenance. However, for the week ending September 16th, it dropped to an 81 week low of 901,000 barrels per day. So it's it's normal to be weak this time of year, but not necessarily this week. So yeah, it's it's soft demand from ethanol. And I think the big reason for that is gasoline demand is, is down uh, and it's down a lot compared to past years. Uh, even we're kind of talking you know, levels that we saw during the pandemic. Some plants also slowed crush, waiting for less expensive new crop corn. The corn situation's tight. That's reflected in the basis. That's no secret. Cash markets are, are really, really strong. Additionally, ethanol prices follow energy prices, which have dropped to the January lows. This has pulled plant margins well off the record levels seen just last fall and idled some plants in Iowa and Minnesota. Uh, there's at least one ethanol plant here that is closed altogether for a little while. Um, most of the other ones are running slowly um, because of the lack of profitability, because of where crude oil is and what the cost of corn is. So. You know, you just go back a few months and ethanol was trading for a dollar cheaper than gasoline at the wholesale level. Today, those two are much closer to parity or, or you know, very close in, in price. There have also been some logistical issues with the rail and the threat of a strike on September 16th had some plants slowing production because their storage was full. Cooper says they anticipate improvements ahead unless the U.S. moves into a deep recession. We know historically when, when the economy enters recession, uh, gasoline demand tends to suffer. Um, and so we are watching that very closely. 50 million bushels in the September WASD. I'm Michelle Brook reporting for Ag Day. All right, thanks, Michelle. The Transportation Department is giving the green light to construct a nationwide network of electric vehicle charging stations along interstate highways. The hope of the administration is to have one charging station about every 50 miles. There is $5 billion in funding for the plan over the next five years. The majority of new EV charging construction could start next spring. But the energy crisis in Europe may be deepening. That's after a series of unusual leaks on two natural gas pipelines running from Russia under the Baltic Sea. Sweden's National Seismic Network says it recorded two explosions near the leaks in the Russian gas pipelines. The Polish prime minister calling the events an act of sabotage, something his Danish counterpart said she couldn't rule out after three leaks were detected on Nord Stream 1 and 2. The pipelines are not bringing gas to Europe amid an energy standoff with Russia following its invasion of Ukraine, but the lines were still filled with gas. Updating you on the Russian war with Ukraine. Now it appears Russian farmers are some of those being drafted to fight on the front lines. Reuters reporting Russian President Vladimir Putin addressed regional heads and the leaders of ag enterprises in the country about it, saying that farmers' families must be supported. Russia is the world's biggest wheat exporter, and there's concern this could add further risk to planting and harvesting. Now, winter grain planting in the country is already delayed due to recent rains, but Putin claims that Russia is on track to harvest a record grain crop this year. Fertilizer prices went on a roller coaster ride after Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and now USDA is releasing more details about a plan to help increase American fertilizer production. USDA is making $500 million in grants available under what's called the Fertilizer Production Expansion Program. The funds are being made available through the Commodity Credit Corporation. Officials say the program will support fertilizer production that is independent, made in America, innovative, and farmer-focused. USDA Chief Economist Seth Meyers speaking at the Ag Outlook Forum in Kansas City this week. He said there is more anxiety for farmers looking ahead to next year. The main reason? Concerns? Commodity prices won't rise at the same rate as input prices, including for things like fertilizer. Part of what we're seeing on, on costs for this crop that uh, folks are harvesting now was some folks bought ahead and didn't face the full brunt of those rising, uh, rising fertilizer prices. Now you're going to face them. And, and I, I don't see an immediate um, uh, solution that brings those prices down quickly. Some we've seen them come off the highs, but, but pre-pandemic pre levels, I think that that's tough to see in the short run. The Biden administration also hoping to tackle hunger in the U.S. by the end of the decade. Officials making a series of announcements ahead of the first White House conference on food, nutrition and health since 1969. 
Now, its strategy includes a pathway to free school meals for all students, expansion of SNAP benefits, development of front-of-package nutrition labels, and a Medicare test of food as medicine. The CEO of Alenco Animal Health telling Ag Day there are three C's that matter to both agriculture and consumers. That's calories, climate, and choice. And he thinks that livestock producers are part of the solution for all three. Animal protein demand continues to grow. It's probably the biggest misknown, even inside our industry sometimes. The last 10 years, we have increased 60 million metric tons. The prediction the next 10 years, 90 million. Another 50% more growth. Why? A lot of continent, a lot of trading, uh, uh, trade where there's people that are increasing their GDP. But the second is um, you're seeing this Western diet, more protein, less carbs. So what we produce is under tremendous demand. The fastest growing food segment today is animal protein. So when demand is up, you turn and say, hey, there's real opportunity here for the farmer to play a role. Now, some parts of the administration's proposal, including increasing access to free school lunches, will need congressional approval. Hurricanes and cotton harvest don't mix. We'll take a closer look at what it could mean for markets coming up next. And later, a new take on that old beefcake calendar and why these are harder than fire. Grains move higher on Tuesday while livestock continue to feel pressure, but it's cotton that's of concern as Ian moves toward the Gulf. Shell Rook joins us again with a closer look. Joining us with market analysis, John Payne with Hedgepoint Global Analysis. And John, cotton market still mostly lower on Tuesday, despite the fact that we're looking at some impending hurricane damage in some of those cotton production areas during harvest. But it's really been more about the economy and global recession fears there, hasn't it? Yeah, I, I think, um, not sure when this is going to air, but Thursday morning, the 28th, it's the Nike earnings. So we'll see kind of what the demand is for apparel, specifically U.S. branded apparel. Uh, we don't get a lot of that from the USDA as far as where things are, um, is, is what the buyers are doing. And I think that's what's what the problem is here. We had contacts in Turkey, which is kind of the big milling hub for a lot of the European manufacturers. Um, a month ago, they said they're they're just not seeing any purchasing. So um, you know the inflation story kind of hits the cotton the most because you don't eat, you don't need to eat your clothing. You need food and energy and, and housing. I think are the, the prices that are going up and, and the clothing markets suffer here. Um, you and I could talk for hours about the supply side problems that we're seeing. Uh, you mentioned the hurricane potentially bearing down on Southwest Georgia. Uh, we have. Uh, record, I'll say record problems in West Texas, but another break in the crowd progress numbers last night for, from cotton, uh, or rather this week. Uh, and then Pakistan, which is, I think, the fifth largest global producer having major problems with their harvest as well. So all in all here, there's the market is structurally very tight. Um, right. We're looking at, at you know stocks to use numbers that are near record lows for the U.S. here. Now, they'll likely adjust the demand lower to, to counter that. But still, we need acreage. And you look at the December 23 contract, sub 75 cents, who's planting cotton next year? Yeah. Do you expect a lot of damage out of this hurricane in those production areas? I don't know. I've always been one to fade the hurricanes, but uh, okay. I'm wrong a lot. So we'll see. All right. Thanks for joining us, John Payne with Hedgepoint Global Analysis. We'll have more Ag Day coming up. To find John's newsletter, This Week in Grain and Oilseeds, head over to www.thisweekingrain.com. We're all just Matt Yurisavik joining us here. Matt, we've been talking a lot about Hurricane Ian and the impacts on Florida. This is another one of those impacts as far as flooding goes. Yeah, and this is just the rain impacts. Obviously, other threats include not only the gusty winds, winds up to or over 75 miles an hour possible, and also the storm surge. And that's what this map does not include. We could be looking at 5 to 10 feet of storm surge in some locations 
heading through the next 48 hours. And on this map here, you can see the flooding potential. Now, one thing about this map is it does not include that storm surge, but does include the heavy rainfall. And you can see really from south of Jacksonville all the way down towards Fort Myers in that red. That is a high likelihood of seeing flooding rains. And again, we looked at it earlier, upwards of 12 to 18 inches of rain could be possible in some of these areas. And a steep cutoff in the rainfall farther to the north, but still dealing with showers and storms farther down to the south could be be looking at flooding rains back into the keys as well. So here's a look at that rainfall again, more of it moving up from the south and wherever that center comes ashore, it is going to be moving and just to the north of that, wherever that center moves, that's where the heaviest of the rain is likely going to fall because it's going to train over the same area for hours and hours on end. And that's where we could be looking at 12 to 18 inches of rain or so that's going to cause problems in and of itself, not even dealing with the wind and the storm surge, at least on the Gulf side and parts of uh, the uh, east coast there of Florida as well. So something that we'll continue to keep an eye on. But grand scheme of things, that's really the only show in town. Other than that, we've got a couple of light showers and storms moving out over the northern Rockies could bring a system in towards the end of this week. But other than that, it's really just Hurricane Ian moving up towards the east coast and kind of interacting with that cold front and bringing more rainfall. So here's what that looks like on our national map. You can see Ian down here off the Florida coast running into that front and showers and storms building along the east coast. A weak front moving through uh, Pennsylvania, bringing some clouds and some light showers. High pressure, though, in control of most of the country, keeping things very warm and very dry as well. Here comes that system bringing in some showers into the upper mid upper northwest and along along the northern Rockies as we head as we head into uh, the end of this week, but still extremely warm in the west, cooler in parts of the Great Lakes and the northeast. But again, watching Ian as that is going to really be the main story over the next couple of days, and we'll continue to track that right here on Ag Day. That's a look around the country. Now let's take a look at the weather where you live. Fort Myers, Florida, heavy rain, thunderstorms and gusty winds with a hurricane warning in effect. Heading to Langdon, North Dakota, mostly sunny and breezy, a high of 65 degrees. And it's 68 in Toledo, Washington with rain and patchy fog. Hog inventories continue to fall. We have details next. And later, a group of volunteer firefighters and their very hot calendar. The June hogs and pigs report from USDA showed the U.S. swine inventory was down 1%. The decline of the nation's hog herd has been a trend for nearly a year. And one livestock economist doesn't see the herd numbers recovering in the USDA's next report set to be released tomorrow. Lee Schultz of Iowa State University says a year ago, porcine reproductive and respiratory syndrome, or PERS, was continuing to spread across hog operations, and the extent of those losses we're still largely unknown. In the 12 months since, he says the supply side remains a concern. It, what we've seen is that's come to fruition, the, the decline in the supply, and, and really you could characterize it as a bit of a retrenching in the industry, uh, where we, we've seen, I think, a, a, taking a step back um, and seeing the supply side really take a breath here and adjust to the higher cost scenario that we're all facing. We're, we're seeing disease pockets out there that's impacting productivity. Now, according to Iowa State's analysis, producers saw their cost of production at a record of more than $100 per hundredweight in July. That was up 24 cents from June. Now, it's thought that declining corn prices this fall could also pull down the cost of production a bit. The World Bank is slashing its economic outlook for China. Its economy now projected to grow less than 3% this year. That is a country prepares to release more pork supplies from state reserves. Beijing planning to sell 200,000 metric tons of pork to help ease prices ahead of its week-long National Day holiday. That begins on October 1st. Now, last week, pork prices were 30% higher than a year ago. Coming up, new firefighter calendars that some are calling hot. But they're not hot for the reason you may think. Many folks in rural America have volunteer firefighters to thank for helping keep them safe. And one volunteer fire department in Kentucky is turning the annual Hunky Husky Hero Steamy Calendar Market on its ear. Check out the brave folks at the Eubank Volunteer Fire Department. The annual calendar is being sold online to raise funds for the department. 
And as you thumb through it, you notice something different right away. The no filter approach. And while they don't bear it all, there are some pretty cheeky photos. We've seen so many of the quote unquote beefcake firefighters and um, that's not what most of your volunteers look like. Want to buy one? Check out the Eubank Fire Department Facebook page, but you better hurry. They completely sold out last year. Apparently they are a pretty hot item. And that's all the time we have this morning. I'm sure glad you tuned in from all of us here at Ag Dam, Clinton Griffiths. Have a great day. Have fun.